Hello and welcome to Coast and Country, the official podcast powered by the science of the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. I'm your host, Brian Scott Smith. The Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station has been in existence since 1875, with the charter to investigate plants and their pests, insects, soil and water, and was inspired by the work of Samuel W. Johnson, a professor of agricultural chemistry at Yale University. All these years later, and the station continues to hold true to its founding values, and then some, as it continues to put science to work for society every day. In this episode, I talk with Dr. Victoria Smith, Deputy State Entomologist for Connecticut and an Associate Scientist within the Entomology Department at the station, about some of the station's programs and services, and we learn about one of Connecticut's newest pests, the spotted lanternfly. Dr. Smith, thanks for joining us. Oh, you're quite welcome. So just explain to us and to our listeners, a very important role, obviously Deputy State Entomologist and also part of the Entomology Department, but what does that all mean? Every state has what's called a plant regulatory agency, and in Connecticut, that agency is the Agricultural Experiment Station. In most states, it's the State Department of Agriculture, but here we have the Experiment Station. My immediate supervisor, the state entomologist, is Dr. Kirby Stafford, but a lot of the day-to-day activity for the regulatory and inspection responsibilities comes to me. So I function as sort of his right hand in a lot of these areas. And just explain to us, entomology, what is that? Entomology is actually the study of insects, everything about them, their life history, what they do, where they live, any damage that they cause to our agricultural crops, and also the beneficial things that they do, such as honeybees and pollinators and that sort of thing. I just would clarify here really quick, I'm not actually an entomologist by training. I'm actually a plant pathologist. I'm sort of stationed in the entomology department. That said, of course, (laughs) insects frequent plants, so I suppose there is that connection. Yes there is. Yep. Now, of course, you have a very diverse role, as does the Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station. Talk to us a little bit about some of these things that we probably are not aware of that you, your department, and the Experiment Station carry out on a daily, yearly basis. One of them I'm going to mention, because we had this in a little pre-chat before we did the interview, something about beekeeping, which was fascinating. Uh, Yes, that's actually outlined in the state statutes. All the beehives in Connecticut have to be registered every year. And it's a goal that we have to try to inspect every beekeeper once a year, although there are so many that we don't usually make that goal. I supervise our bee inspector, and he does do a fair number of bee inspections every Every year. And I just want to say that these inspections, we treat them more as a teachable moment rather than something that you should fear. He's very good at helping people out, giving people pointers on when they have a problem with their beehives and problems do come up. So that's one of our responsibilities. One thing that's fun about this position is I never really know what's going to come across my desk at any moment. It might be something about bees. It might be something about plants. It might be something about other insects. It might be something completely unrelated. So that's one thing that's sort of fun. You never know what's going to happen. And just to add to the point that you've already made, I mean, really, the Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station, a bunch of expert problem solvers, rather, as you said, than enforcers, because at the end of the day, we've got enough enforcement. And although I'm sure you do have a certain amount of power in that regard, I mean, it really is about solving problems for people, isn't it? Absolutely. Our informal motto of the experiment station is science and service to society. We try to bring the best scientific information that is available, that's out there, and make it so that your life is a little bit better whether that's being able to grow better garden plants or have healthy trees or a healthy lawn or get your soil tested for whatever nutrients that the soil might need. We also do tick testing and a certain amount of product testing here at the experiment station. So yes, we are trying to make things better for everyone. Just before we get into that a little bit more, and I hope you don't mind me asking you this this slightly Mm -hmm. more personal question, what got you interested in this field of science because it's quite specific. It is very important. This is why we do these podcasts, obviously, about the experiment station. But what got you interested in this area of science? 
Oh, there's so much out there. I'll, I'll just speak from a personal level. There's just so much out there in the natural world that I don't think any one person can understand all of it. And ever since I was a little kid, I wanted nothing more out of life than to be a scientist. And this is basically where I ended up. And in my current position, I can use what I know about plants and plant pathology. I've also learned a tremendous amount over the years about insects and insect behavior, insect ecology, a fair amount about invasive species. So it's just interesting. That's all I can say. <laughs> Get out there in the real world and take a look at it and you'll begin to see things that you never saw before. We are very fortunate to have the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station and scientists like yourself there. What is it actually like being part of such a formidable organization that's been around for a very long time, but it's also probably one of the biggest secrets in the state. One big advantage is if something comes across and I can't identify it or I don't know anything about it, there is usually someone either a phone call away or down the hall or in the other building that I can say, hey, what can you tell me about this? We're all very open. We're all very friendly to each other. I don't think there's anyone here who I can't call up and say, can you give me a hand with this? Because I just don't understand it. And that's very helpful. So that's one of the real strengths that we have. We've got a lot of diversity among the skills of the staff. And like I said, if someone on staff can't answer the question, chances are they'll have a buddy on the internet or someone else that they can call. Occasionally, we call people down at Yale to ask a question about something. We also have a lot of connections with the University of Connecticut. And I also rely on a number of experts from USDA and from the U.S. Forest Service. So there's quite a large network of people that we can tap their expertise. And that is really wonderful. And conversely, I know that all of you at the Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station are very humble. You're actually recognized, the organization is recognized nationally in the U.S. because people come to you as well, don't they? Absolutely, we do. And we try to nurture those connections again because it benefits everyone. Talk to us a little bit more about obviously some of this other work that you do, nurseries in particular. So we're sort of getting into the field of your interest, which is plants. What do you do with the nurseries here in Connecticut? Well, we do several different functions with the nurseries. Like I said earlier, uh, just like all the beekeepers have to register by state statute, all the nursery growers and the nursery dealers also are required by state statute to register their businesses every year. We try to get out to all of the nurseries at least once a year to do a yearly inspection. And again, we treat this more as a learning experience rather than something that is related to enforcement. We tell them, you know, what insect pests we're seeing, what occasionally what weed problems we're seeing in their nurseries, basically give them ideas as to how they can grow the plants better and have a better product. The nursery industry in Connecticut is very large. It's reported to be in the millions of dollars worth of value and the nursery industry industry also employs some 40,000 people. And many people are surprised by that, but that's the figures that we have from the latest farm census. And so again, we just basically try to help these nursery growers out to make to produce the best plants possible. We also use the nurseries in surveys for invasive insects and occasionally invasive diseases that might occur in those nurseries. So those are just a couple of the things that we do with the nursery industry. Another thing that you assist with is the US Forestry Service Aerial Survey. Talk to us about that because this is very important as well. <laughs> That's something that we do with a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Forest Service. We, every summer, well, not last summer because of virus restrictions, but usually in the summer, we spend several days, usually about 40 hours of flying time, crisscrossing the state in a small aircraft, and we map any damage that we see in the forest. This started years and years ago when, we, when the state was suffering from severe gypsy moth outbreaks. However, now we also, we map gypsy moth, we map drought, we map 
any damage from tropical storms or from hurricanes or tornadoes, basically anything that we can see from the air. We do this in cooperation with the Connecticut Wing of Civil Air Patrol, an air auxiliary function. They usually do things like search and rescue and drug interdiction, but with us, we do forest survey, which is sort of fun. Again, last year, we did not accomplish that because it's impossible to social distance in a four foot wide cockpit of a plane. And we're hoping this year we'll be able to do that, but we don't know. It all depends on what the status of the virus restrictions are this year. That's another function that we do. So it takes a bit of training and practice to be able to do this, but once you learn it, it's really kind of funny because you can be driving down the highway and basically identifying trees by their shape and color at 60 miles an hour because you're so accustomed to seeing them from the air. I was going to say, are you ever off duty, you and the scientists? Because when you do this, it sort of becomes second nature, really. It actually does. It's really kind of funny because somebody will say, oh, look at that tree over there. And I say, oh, yeah, that's a sugar maple. Well, how do you know that's a sugar maple? Well, I just know it becomes sort of like recognizing your friend's faces. <laughs> Now, another very important thing is you do a, a sort of like commodities for export because people forget that, uh, you know, Connecticut does export things as well as import them. Explain to us what uh, this particular service is about. Correct. We do that in cooperation with the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA. On their behalf, we certify commodities for export from the state, and we also certify commodities that are crossing state lines. Last year, we certified over 500 loads of plant material to other countries. Now, by this, I mean a lot of it was nursery stock going to Canada. A lot of it was seeds going to European countries. One of our biggest exports, believe it or not, is tobacco. Connecticut ranks eighth in the U.S. in exports of tobacco. A lot of that is very fine quality tobacco leaf that is grown to wrap cigars. Most of that goes to Honduras, Dominican Republic, and Nicaragua. Again, we never know what commodity is going to come across the desk to be exported. In terms of interstate exports, a tremendous amount of seeds goes to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is considered uh, basically another U.S. state in terms of regulatory affairs. It is a U.S. territory, so it doesn't require an international certificate, but an interstate certificate. We also have a fair number of businesses that have started up just in the last year or so that export specialty houseplants to other states. And they are doing a booming business this year. I think we're close to 100 of those certificates that we've issued so far in 2021. So quite a number. And again, people don't think of this. Wow, Connecticut is an exporter. Yes, we are. The other thing I just wanted to ask you, we've mentioned export. Do you also, if anything's imported, do you get involved in that at all? Nope, we don't do any of that. Customs and Border Protection handles imports. We've talked about these important services, Doctor, that the Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station carries out. You sort of like uh, mentioned one of the pests a little bit earlier with the gypsy moth when we were talking about the U.S. Forestry Aerial Survey. But uh, of course, constantly having new pests and critters sort of like come into the state, which clearly you're keeping an eye on. One of them is a thing called the spotted lanternfly. Why is that causing such concern? The spotted lanternfly is sort of the new kid on the block. This insect is native to China and India and those areas in Asia. It uh, appeared in a stone yard in Pennsylvania in 2014 and since then has been spreading to many other areas in Pennsylvania and to several other states. Spotted lanternfly is an interesting insect in that it's basically a giant leafhopper and if you know anything about giant leafhoppers you know that they suck the juices out of plants. They don't chew. They're basically a suck insect and they also have a fairly nasty disgusting liquid excrement euphemistically referred to as honeydew and we'll get to those in just a minute the real danger with spotted lanternfly is that it lays eggs on basically anything some insects are very picky about what they'll lay eggs on spotted lanternfly is not if it stands still long enough the spotted lanternfly will lay eggs on it the other problem with that is the eggs look like just a smear of mud or a piece of lichen. They don't look like 
anything that would be a threat. And this is one way that the insect gets around. These egg masses, there may be 80 to 100 eggs in each egg mass. These egg masses can get transported on trucks, on vehicles, on containers, on products, anywhere in the country, and no one would notice them, and that can spread the insect around. Now, the damage to the agricultural crops that this insect causes, again, it's a sucking insect. It causes tremendous damage to grapevines. It has also been reported to cause damage on hops. So those are two crops that are near and dear to everyone because from grapevines come wine and from hops comes beer. So if you like your wine and you like your beer, you've got something to be concerned about with the spotted lanternfly. It also has been reported to cause crop damage on other plants as well, such as fruit crops and that sort of thing. But by far, the biggest damage is to grapevines. There's a growing small vineyard industry in Connecticut that should be very concerned about spotted lanternfly. Now, if you'll remember too, I said that the spotted lanternfly's other problem is this liquid excrement, this honeydew. The honeydew is very high in sugar. That's because the insect is sucking the nice sugary sap out of the plants, is also excreting the sugar. When you get huge masses of the spotted lanternfly, which can occur in high populations, there's a lot of excrement. There's a lot of honeydew. And there's a black fungus that grows on the honeydew, uses it as a food source called sooty mold. The sooty mold can absolutely coat surfaces. It can coat grass and kill the grass. It can kill small plants. So the insect is not directly killing the grass, but the sooty mold that grows on its excrement is. Now, when you get high populations also, the excrement can make surfaces such as stairs and decks slippery. It's been reported that people are slipping in the honeydew and falling down steps, so it can cause a problem. This insect is basically a twofold problem. It can be an agricultural pest in that it can kill plants such as grapevines. It's also what we would consider a quality of life pest. If you're sitting out on your deck on a warm summer evening, you don't want liquid excrement raining down on you. That can be very unpleasant. So these are basically two facets of the hazard that's presented by the spotted lanternfly. How big a problem has it become here in Connecticut? Last summer, just around Labor Day, we found populations in lower Fairfield County. And by a population, we mean adults plus egg masses. So they were actively reproducing in lower Fairfield County. There also have been reports of what we call interceptions, basically one insect alive or dead at several other locations. But we do know that we have populations in lower Fairfield County. We feel that this is just the tip of the iceberg or maybe the first wave in a tsunami that the insect is very likely to spread from those locations. One thing that I want to point out, we did find several populations. The thing that wakes me up at three in the morning is the idea that we didn't find some populations. So we're sure that there are probably some out there that we didn't find and probably will find them this year. Clearly, it's a situation, as you say, should concern everybody. doesn't matter if they're in business. It should concern all of us as residents of Connecticut. This little pest is actually quite identifiable, though, isn't it? Yes, it is. The picture, if you do an internet search on spotted lanternfly, you'll see a picture of a fairly spectacular, very pretty insect that looks vaguely like a butterfly. It has a pair of wings in the front that are tan and black spotted, and another Another pair of wings in the rear that are red and black spotted and a yellow and black abdomen. Now, it's very seldom out in nature that you're going to see the insect looking like that. Most of the time, you're going to see it sitting quietly with its wings folded. You'll only see the tan and black spotted wings. The nymphs, the initial stages of the insect, are also fairly distinctive. They don't look like any of our native insects. The first and second instar or life stage of the nymphs are black and white, and they move very rapidly. The third instar of the nymphs, the third stage, right before they become adults, is a fairly spectacular red, black, and white spotted insect that's about the size of my little finger, about three-eighths of an inch long. So they're fairly spectacular, and one thing that's great about this insect, it is very easy to identify because it doesn't look like anything else that we have in our native complement of insects. 
One question to put to you, does it have any sort of natural predators that we're aware of? Well, in fact, I just saw a webinar. There are a number of little tiny wasp species that do lay their eggs in the egg masses of spotted lanternflies. So there may be some predators out there. Again, this is, this is a fairly new pest for this continent. So a lot of this information is very preliminary, but that does give hope if we can find some predators of the egg masses, that would be a great thing to cut down on the population. It's not been recorded that any birds will feed on these insects, so I don't know if we can depend on that, but there is hope for these egg mass predators. Now, when I say wasps, people will think, oh my gosh, it's going to sting me. No, these wasps are very tiny. You would need a magnifying glass to find them, and they're not going to sting you. They're just too little and too tiny, and you're probably not even going to notice them. If we have a property, a garden or whatever, and we're looking after it, and, um, and we spot like these pests and bugs, we have a tendency to get the old insecticide out and, and deal with them. What would you sort of like advise to people? Should we sort of like be looking at these things a little bit more closely? And, and if we have any concerns, should we be contacting the, the station? Absolutely. That's another thing that we do is we answer a tremendous number of public inquiries every year. We did set up an email box specifically for reports of spotted lanternfly and I encourage anyone who thinks that they have spotted lanternfly to snap a picture of it and email that picture. Your inquiry will be answered because I answer every one of them. I promise you that. It won't be one of those things that you send off and nobody ever gets back to you. Every inquiry is answered. That email box is report slf at ct.gov. And the other important thing to ask you as well as I suppose one of course that will be great that people send their photos etc to you. In a way I'm guessing it can help you with monitoring because ultimately I'm assuming you're going to if you're not already you'll start some sort of maybe statewide monitoring if it becomes that much of a bigger issue. Absolutely. We are depending on what we refer to as citizen scientists who send in reports of anything that we see. And like I said, every report will be responded to and we really appreciate these reports. In fact, one or two, I can't remember, one or two of the populations in Lower Fairfield County last year were from people who saw the insect, snapped a picture of it, and sent it to us. And again, that email box is report slf at ct.gov. Question I want to put to you because I often ask this and I think it's often on people's minds as well. We hear so much about climate change going on in our world. Are we seeing so like an increase in some of these, you know, uh, pests and bugs moving from certain parts of either the continental US or the rest of the world because the climate is changing and it's making it a little bit more sort of an enticing area for them to come to? Yes, we are seeing some of that. There are locations in Connecticut where kudzu, which is an invasive plant very common in the south, formerly the kudzu wouldn't survive the winters here, but now we have locations where it does survive. I think we're going to start seeing more range expansion of some of these invasive insects and invasive plants in the future. I mean, to people listening, they're probably going to think, oh, well, you know, why is that necessarily a big issue? So the question is, why is that an issue? Well, we'd like to maintain our populations of our native plants, first of all. And second of all, when you have range expansion, you just don't know what the consequences are going to be. It might turn into a new pest. Also, when, just like we're seeing with the spotted lanternfly, there's probably insects, other parasitoids in its native range that keeps the insect in check. Those parasitoids toids aren't present in the new range. So you could get explosive population growth of these insects. Well, Dr. Victoria Smith, Deputy State Entomologist and Associate Scientist of the Entomology Department at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and thank you for clarifying and telling us about the many, many avenues of different work that you and the team carry out there. And in particular, we'll all be on the lookout for a spotted lanternfly this year and hope that we can help you and the scientists keep an eye on this latest visitor to Connecticut. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Podcast. Great. Thank you for the opportunity to get the word out. And you can find out more about the programs and services the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station provide and many other topics at the station's website at ct.gov forward slash CAES. 
That's all from this edition of Coast and Country. Thank you for listening, and we'll be dishing up another serving of science very soon. <laughs>